Uh, thank you for coming to the Escape Room Puzzle Design Seminar. I'm Juliana Moreno Patel. I'm Arielle Rubin. And we are the Wild Optimists. So we'll just give you a little background about who we are, and then we will dive right into it. Uh, so Wild Optimist creates games and puzzle quests for a wide variety of formats. Um, of course, we got our start in tabletop with Escape Room in a Box, the werewolf experiment, and uh, we now have Escape Room in a Box flashback out as well. But in addition to that, we've kind of created a career just doing puzzles and games everywhere. So we work with music festivals and theme parks and marketing activations, basically anywhere that could be improved by puzzles and games. That's what we want to do. And we strongly believe just about everything can be improved with puzzles and games. <laughs> So thank you all so much for coming to this. This is a workshop on how to create your puzzles. And we've tailored it um, a bit towards tabletop, but as we go through, there'll be um, different places for questions. So you can ask about the projects you're working on or why you're here. And how do we see the beginning of the presentation? Let's thank see you. it. Just ask for it. <laughs> Got it. Okay. okay. All right. So we... So a fun little uh, header slip. So we eat, sleep, puzzle, and repeat, right? So that is what we're going to talk to you about today. Next slide. I'm going to, I have it on my phone, guys. This is really, real complicated technology. So I'm going <laughs> to put it here so I'm kind of looking at you and not off screen. Yep. Next slide, please. All right. So we are going to be covering what is a puzzle. But we'll just start there. Uh, then puzzle theory, sort of how we think about puzzles when we're designing them. Then we'll go into a bunch of different types of puzzles, and you want to have a wide variety of puzzles in whatever you're creating. And then the process of playtesting and where to go for further research. Next slide. Yeah. <laughs> can you say, see it already, Juliana? Up. Because I can't. Sorry, um, guys. Sorry. Yes, I can. So I think there's like a slight delay. Um, so we'll just start going so there's not a random delay. All right, so what is a puzzle? Um, this is our definition. Of course, people have different definitions, but we like to say that a puzzle is solving a series of logical steps to get a well-defined solution. So that means that this isn't just something sort of randomly out of your head. This is something that anyone can solve. So if we look at the next slide, we'll get into it more. So a puzzle should not have any ambiguous answers. So anything where there's two or three or four answers that could technically all be true, where if you followed a series of logical steps, you could get to multiple answers, that's a puzzle that's broken and you need to fix it so that there is just one clear answer. It should also not have any leaps of logic. That's where you have something in your head where you know you show them a reveal and the reveal is red. And so they think, oh, the answer is red. But you're like, no, the answer is three because red has three letters in it, obviously. Like that's a leap of logic that exists in your head and doesn't exist in anyone else's head. So you want to avoid those in puzzle design. Next slide. Uh, so when you are creating a puzzle, your goal is always fun. It's not about proving that you are the smartest, cleverest designer out there. It's about maximizing the amount of fun that your players are having. So you want to be creative, you want to be innovative, surprise them with things that they've never seen before, and make unexpected twists that they never saw coming. And that's really going to lead to player delight, which is what you're going for. Next slide. Right. All right. So, and this is a really important thing. Harder is not better. Next slide. <laughs> I can, I'll, I'll just go ahead and, and spoil it for you. What it says is seriously, harder is not better. The point of designing a puzzle is not to make something that frustrates your players. You're not creating a puzzle to prove that you are smart. You're creating a puzzle to bring joy and fun and to make your players feel smart. Good puzzle design makes your players feel like the hero. Next slide. 
So different players are good at different things. And as Ariel just said, you want your players to feel like the hero. So you always want to think when you're designing of giving people hero moments. And so if different players are good at different things, it's really important to have all different types of challenges and puzzles so that everyone has their moment to shine. Next slide. So as you're designing a full puzzle quest, there are some things to think about, and we're going to go into them a bit more, but it's basically theme versus narrative, which is another way to think about that is setting versus story. Next slide. So in and so ideally in your puzzle quest, you come up with a story and this is, you know, you're in an escape room, a puzzle quest online, whatever it is, you've come up with a story and all of the puzzles that you put in would authentically be in that story if you were doing it in real life. So say you are breaking into a casino, you would really have to, you know, figure out the code to get into the back, which might involve finding out the security guards birthday or whatever it is. These are real narrative puzzles that fit organically into your story. But that's not always possible. Next slide. So you also, if you can't do all narrative slide, all narrative puzzles, you at least want to do all themed puzzles. That is still going to work for your players. And these are all puzzles that fit in the world. So if you're in a casino, you would have puzzles with cards, you would have puzzles with chips, puzzles with dice. They might not be things that you would actually have to do if you were trying to break into a casino, but they still feel like they belong in this space and that still works for the game. Next slide. Depending on your audience, you're going to want to design puzzles. Um, well, you're going to want to design puzzles that fit your audience. So if you're doing um, an escape room in the United States, for example, it might be fine to design puzzles that are all that are all in English and that play with English as a language. But if you're designing a tabletop game and you want it to go to other countries, it's really useful to think about language agnostic puzzles. Um, these are puzzles that don't have words. Maybe they have symbols um, that you can sub in for words in other languages. Um, maybe there's, you know, ciphers. There's different things that you can do, but it's important to think about creating puzzles that translate easily. And just uh, just as an example, for our first game, Escape Room in a Box, the Werewolf Experiment, we never expected it to go to other countries. Um, we designed it completely based upon the English language. And then it ended up going to other countries, which was awesome, but we had to redesign about half the game. Next slide. Next slide. Another thing that you really want to be aware of when designing is red herrings. Red herrings are the worst in puzzle games. In mysteries, they have their place, but in puzzles, they are the worst. And a red herring is essentially when you put something there to distract your player and take up their time, where it looks like a puzzle, it seems like a puzzle, but it's not going to get them any useful information that is going to get them closer to their goal. And the other thing to know about red herrings is players are always going to create their own. We try so hard to create games without red herrings, but players still love to find connections and they, they're they puzzling. So they're looking at every detail and really breaking everything down. Now, if you see that all players are creating the same red herring, like say you chose a really beautiful curling font that fit your story world so well, but everyone thinks there's a secret message hidden in the curls of the font, you're going to have to change the font because you don't want them wasting their time and getting frustrated. Again, you are looking for them to have fun, not be frustrated. Uh, next slide. And now we're at questions. Does anyone have any questions on um, on the, what we've gone over so far, sort of the basic overview of puzzles? Give everyone a second. All right, Goldfinch Gamers says no. Uh -huh. I have this on my phone now, so I can nope, look at it. No edits. questions yet. Uh, I think they're just enjoying all right, it. Well, then let's keep going. Perfect. All right, next slide, please. Foxy Donuts, I love your username. <laughs> that sounds great. <laughs> All right, so if we go to the next slide, um, 
we are going to start talking about puzzle games. So these are games where, in, where you don't, you aren't just putting a puzzle or two in. The entire game um, is based around puzzles. So as you're designing a full puzzle game, you want to think about a bell curve of difficulty. The puzzles at the start of a game should be easy. You want to get, you want to earn your players' trust. You want them to feel smart and get their energy up so that they feel like I can do this. This is going to be fun. And they really, you know, go at the rest of the game. Your hardest puzzle should come right, right after the midpoint, right around or right after the midpoint, when people have like really revved up, their brains are really working and they have the capacity and the excitement to do a more complicated or harder puzzle. And then, we I'm can let Juliana take it, yeah. but I'm going to keep going. Go ahead. Um, and then as you go further, and then as you keep going, the puzzles at the end of the game should again be easy. There's actually been studies that show that like the more stressed people get, um, the harder it is the, to do puzzles. The, the, their brains don't work quite as well. So as you get towards the end of the game, again, you want your puzzles to get easier because you want people to finish with a sense of momentum and fun. Next okay. slide. We can go to the next slide, but I did see, we did actually get a question from Soy Lenser um, asking, isn't it bad if the only thing that looks interesting is the solution, like the neon signs at the villain's lair? And I think that's a great question. The way we think about puzzles is the actual elements of the puzzles themselves should be what grab your attention and what are interesting, and you're still gonna need to puzzle through them. It's not as though you're saying to them, here is the puzzle and ex here is exactly how you solve it. They still need to figure out what to do with all of these disparate parts, how to put them together, how to figure out the solution. So the actual working on the puzzle and figuring out the solution, that's where your attention and energy is. So the most basic example I can think of is when you do a jigsaw puzzle, you spill out all the pieces, that's it. That's your puzzle. That's your focus. That's your neon sign saying this is the puzzle. But you still need to go through the process of figuring out exactly how to solve the puzzle. So that's why we don't want a bunch of red herrings distracting. Even if people know what they're supposed to work on, the joy should be in figuring out how they're supposed to work on it and what they're supposed to do with it. So thank you for that question. Um, and then, yeah. Yeah, and I think I'm going to... we're gonna, I'll, Go for J-Cubed Vision's first question, and then Armchair Escapist. I think we're about to get there on the next slide. <laughs> Is Juliana still... Okay, it just sort of frozen on my screen. Cool. So um, how important is it to give your players a starting point or premise? I think it's very important. I mean, it sort of depends on your, on your format, right? If you're doing... If somebody is buying a puzzle book, then you don't necessarily have to have a narrative but the way that we design puzzles is we always start with some sort of narrative. Why are your players doing this puzzle? What's their setting? What are they hoping to get from the experience? I think giving your players an entrance point and some sort of onboarding with a starting point or premise will get them excited and, um, I'm, I'm missing the right word, but really into the puzzles and immersed in the puzzles in a way that if you just kind of like put something in front of them, they'll just be confused and not sure what to do. And then in terms of J-Cube's other question oh, of what are the ways to achieve communicating that starting point, you really can do a lot with placement, lighting, sound if you're in an actual physical space or with color and layout if you are doing something in tabletop. So, you know, I even in video games, they used to make the things you're supposed to interact with like a little bit sharper and everything was a bit more blurry. So you were like, ah, this is clearly something I should touch. And you wanna translate that into real life experiences and tabletop experiences. So you wanna put the puzzle elements right where people are gonna walk in and interact with them. You wanna have lights on them so it's clear that this is 
a good starting place. And in tabletop, same thing, your artwork, it, you want it to be centered, you want it to be eye-catching, so people know, okay, this is an interesting thing that I should start with. Right, let's get to the next slide. So as um, we mentioned, and I, I am looking at this on Twitch too, Desiree, and what I see is sort of Juliana talking silently. Is it just delayed? Uh, okay. Cool. All right. So as we said, so um, bell curve hardest at the top, then it gets easier. And this is because people like winning. We tend to make games where practically everyone wins. We make games for a mass market audience. Um, and as we are designing our games, we want most people to win because people like to win. But if you, but if you want some people to lose, you want to, you know, aim for like 25 to 40% win rate. That's what I think a lot of escape rooms aim for. Your goal though, is that most groups should lose near the end. And that's like in the last five minutes because you want everyone to feel smart and you want everyone to end the game happy. You want them to feel like, oh, if I had just done that one thing a little bit differently, then I could have won. It isn't that I was just dumb and I just like lost horribly and there was no way I could ever have done this. It was, oh, well, if I just done that little thing or, and that can often spark a really interesting, you know, what you could have done differently. And people still feel smart even if they lose, as long as it's near the end. So that's, you should really have like 90% of your groups either winning or losing within the last five minutes. And in terms of how do you, so I'm now looking at armchair final solve with the high rate of breaking out. Um, some great rooms have had a lackluster finale because the last puzzle was too easy and we left going, what was that? I think that that's, not necessarily about the puzzle being too easy. I would say that that's about the puzzle and the finale not being innovative enough. So something that Juliana and I often talk about isn't necessarily how easy a puzzle is to solve, but how innovative or exciting a puzzle is to solve. So for example, we have a quest that's up right now um, and we'll give you guys the link at the end, but everyone's favorite puzzle is this box of buttons. Um, and you have to look at the buttons and figure out a pattern. We, you know, we've done, we, do, we did a lot of play testing on it. We pulled, that was everyone's favorite puzzle. It's not that hard a puzzle, um, but it's really pretty. It's something that I think people spark to because it's something familiar. There's like a nostalgia factor to it because there's all of these lovely buttons. And it's not so, you really, you have to think for a minute to figure out how to figure it out. So it makes people feel smart. Um, and then in terms of that's the last puzzle and then there's an activity at the end. I think as long as that end moment, once you solve the puzzle is something big that feels exciting, it's not going to feel lackluster. In my experience, when a puzzle is felt lackluster at the end, it's not because it was easy. It's because when I solved it, I was like, okay, so I solved it and did I solve it? Like, is that the last, is, is this it? Is, is it over? And it's because there wasn't enough of a button. There wasn't enough of a finale built into the experience. Um, so let's go to the next slide. Okay, so there's two different ways that we think about the flow and the map of the puzzle when we are designing, and that is linear versus nonlinear. So a linear game is going to have, you have to solve puzzle one in order to get to puzzle two, and that gets you to puzzle three. And a nonlinear, which is also called open plan game, there's multiple paths. You can start in many different places. You're going to have to solve everything eventually, but it's really up to you and your group of how you're going to solve it. And this uh, crazy picture here, it's actually the map of our first game. That's the map of Werewolf Experiment. So you can see how many different paths are open to people right when they open the box. And we can switch slides. So both, both linear and non-linear games have pros and cons to them. So in a linear game, one pro is that it's really good for new players. And I don't know if the statistics on this are still true, but I know like in escape rooms, um, it used to be that like it was still like 80% of players were new players. Uh, in, in tabletop, if you're putting in a puzzle or putting in a couple puzzles, you're probably, it's, 
people who aren't necessarily expecting puzzles, so they could also be considered new players. So a linear format is easy to follow for people who aren't used to a big um, abstract puzzle format. So it, it, is, it is good for people who want that clarity. But a linear um, format also has the issue of bottlenecks. So if you have a really um, good group, then what you have is like one or two people solving the puzzle and everyone else just being like, oh, okay, that's cool. Um, and that's something that I found in, you know, I've been playing a number of the virtual escape room experiences. And that's something that, you know, comes up a lot online is that it's because you can't spread out in a room it's hard not to do a linear experience and it's hard not to have bottlenecks. Um, and we've just sort of, you know, our solution to that has just been to cut down the number of players. But you want, if you are doing something that is linear um, and you're trying to avoid bottlenecks, something that you can do is have bigger puzzles where, with a lot of different elements where people, where everyone can work on maybe their own elements. So in a virtual context, this might be that like if you have one of those tanagram puzzles where you have to put pieces together um, to make a certain shape, you might say, okay, well, we're putting together a town and there's three different houses to put together and then everyone can sort of break up and put together their own house as an example off the top of my head. So a bigger puzzle in a linear format can help with the bottleneck problem. Next slide. So nonlinear games have the very obvious pro of they have something for everyone. They can keep everyone actively engaged because there's a bunch of different paths. But the con is that this can be confusing because people might not be sure what things go together and they might be trying to put together things that are on two separate paths. So you want to be careful and do as much signposting as you can. Just as an example, in our game Flashback, we definitely wanted it to be open plan because those escape room games have actual physical elements and we really like them to be playable by a larger group where they can spread out the elements and all be doing different things. But we didn't want people getting confused. So we color coded them and had a very different kind of aesthetic and design for the three separate paths. So as much as possible, you do want to kind of signpost in these open plan rooms of what goes on which track and what should go together. Next slide. Another thing that can help with confusion um, is gating. So gating is, the easiest example of gating is a lock. You're like on a door. So you solve all the puzzles in one room. There's a locked door that is the gate and then you get through it and there's another set of puzzles. Gating really helps so that players aren't overwhelmed. It also helps to re-energize groups. Oh my goodness, I opened the box, I opened the door. You know, I got through this thing. There's all of this new stuff to play with. It, the excitement always comes up um, when you get through one of those gates. Something that we have found that is really important to think about if you do have gates in your game is to not give players something before a gate that they can't solve yet that turns into a red herring. So for example, if you have, let's see, um, I keep going back to the jigsaw puzzle. Jigsaw puzzles are very useful for these things. Um, if you have a jigsaw puzzle and you've given them half of it and then the other half is on the other side of the gate, but it isn't clear that they can't solve it without the missing pieces, then it can be very frustrating for players They can, and you will lose their trust. And really you wanna keep the players trust, you wanna keep them happy and energized. Next slide. So, in terms of thinking about puzzles in games and almost more specifically tabletop games, if you want to put some puzzles into your tabletop games, you want to consider, do you want these puzzles to be cooperative experiences or competitive experiences? If they're a cooperative experience where the entire group is working together, they can be a bit longer, take more time and have more elements but you want to be careful that there's not a bottleneck. So you want to make sure that it's the sort of puzzle that really gives some everyone something to do. So like a simple example would be a word find where everyone can be looking at it and trying to find words at the same time. If it's competitive, 
You want it to be much shorter because people are going to be trying to solve it faster than the other people and everyone else might be waiting. And it can be a lot more in their head as opposed to a more visual for a cooperative puzzle. This can be one that happens more in the player's head and it's like a quick solve that they can do. Next slide. So it's really important to think about who is your audience. Um, if you are designing a puzzle for a tabletop game that is within a larger tabletop game, and we've done this, um, then you, these people sat down to just play a normal game. They didn't necessarily sit down to do puzzles. So you have to think about that. Like, what is a puzzle that is going to be exciting for people who are mostly sitting down to, you know, play a deck building game or whatever it is? But hardcore gamers still may want something that is a bit more difficult. So you, ha you have to think about crafting a puzzle that will really still make them feel smart, but fit within the game. Next, Next slide. When you're designing for your tabletop game, you also want to think about the materials that you already have in your game. From manufacturing, we know very well that every single thing you put in your game adds to the overall cost of the game. So as much as possible, you want to design for the materials that you already know you're going to have. Are you going to have dice? Are you going to have cubes? Are you going to have meeples? You can really turn anything into a puzzle and it can be a really fun challenge to say, here's my sandbox. I have these different elements and now I can do whatever I want. How are the strange and fun ways that I can combine them and turn them into different puzzles? And you also want to keep in mind what elements are reusable. Like, for example, if you're doing something with the cubes, that's reusable. You just destroy whatever you did and then you can build it back up again. Or is it something where they're going to need to write on it and maybe you give them the ability to reprint whatever it is that they've written on or folded or torn. But you want to make sure that there is a way for the game to have some sort of life after, if possible, because especially tabletop players are always looking for that additional value of being able to reuse or at least give something away and have someone else use it. Next slide. All right, so we are at questions again. Oh, and we have one right there. Should you always make sure players know what the ultimate goal to achieve is, or do you worry about that spoiling the narrative surprises? Um, I've been in rooms where we literally don't know if we were anywhere close to ultimate success. I think you do. You should let players know what their goal is. Um, you know, we generally we we do talk about this. Players get really confused if they if they don't know what they're doing. Now that doesn't mean that you can't put in twists. Um, but players should know, like, theoretically, I am trying, so we're working on um, some mystery games right now, and there's just one lock. And so, you know, the first act, as we're calling it, is to figure out how to unlock that lock. And we, at first, we didn't have that in the instructions. We're like, there's a lock. Of course, people are going to try to figure out how to unlock it. And they actually didn't. That wasn't something that they thought of off the top of their head. So we have now put it into the narrative that that is their first goal and players are a lot happier knowing what their goal is. Um, it doesn't necessarily have to spell out what the narrative, why that is like what the narrative twists are going to be to get there. Yeah. I think you can say, okay, you know, your goal is to, you know, recover the lost Ark. However, you're going to have to figure out what are the correct steps in order to be able to do that. But at least everyone knows what they're driving for. Um, and then Panda had a question. Do themes help you design the escape room games? Absolutely. When we sit down to design, we always, always start with the narrative and the theme. And we say, what is the world? What are they doing? And all of our puzzles are built from knowing what that world is. So that is step number one for us anytime we go to design a game. Um, and Mr. Noel Games, you're jumping ahead. We'll get there. We have a whole slide on it. We promise. <laughs> um, all right, let's go on to the next slide. So now we're going to talk a little bit about specific puzzles. Um, everyone has their own vocabulary of how they think about puzzles and what's within a puzzle game. This section is how we think of things. So this is, these are our definitions. Next slide. 
So we separated into two categories. You have puzzles versus interactions. And an easy way to think about this is that one requires thinking and one requires actions. And you want to include a mix of these in your games. Next slide. So let's start with interactions. And obvious, this is an obvious action that anyone would take. So for example, you have a key, you have a lock, anyone would put the key into the lock. This should be, um, this should be play tested though to make sure that they're obvious to everybody. Sometimes things that are obvious to us as the designers are not obvious to everybody, hence play testing. Next slide. Okay, so another interaction is easy and hard searches. So this is something that uh, is pretty easy to have in a puzzle game. If it's in a real world space, you can put things in obvious places. This would be an easy search where you're looking inside drawers or behind a pillow, anything like that. And then there's also alternate searching where you're using a black light or a red lens or something that transforms the space and then you need to search the space again. And, uh, and hard searches are things that are places you probably would never think to look, like under a baseboard or behind a heavy chair. And these can be really fun and a great way to combine narrative and puzzling. Like, where did this character hide their treasures and why did they choose that place to hide them? It can really reveal a lot about your story. But if you're putting in hard searches, you wanna make sure that you have clues or ideally a puzzle that's gonna tell players exactly where they need to look. Because if they're not gonna find it just in a quick, easy search, it's gonna be super frustrating if the GM comes in in the end and is like, aha, you have to lift the third baseboard halfway down. No one's ever gonna think to do that. But if they solve a puzzle that points them to that space, it's like, oh, how exciting. It's been here the whole time. We've been walking right over it, but now we know this is a place we should lift up and look. Uh, next slide. Another interaction is simple placement. So this is putting something where it obviously goes. For example, you have a torch, you put it in, you know, you put it in the torch holder. Um, key Scott. into a lock. <laughs> Scott, there you go. Something like that. <laughs> Sorry guys, caffeine. Um, another fun interaction can be a physical challenge. This should be easy and players should have plenty of chances. So for example, this could be throwing bags into a bucket that is not particularly close and you know that will then set off a very cool thing but we played uh, rooms where we're just really bad at throwing things i think but we went through all the bags and we ended up having to use our shoes so you should always make sure that players have plenty of opportunity to do it physical challenges though are great because they're there's something different. Um, they make people work in a different way and it, they bring the energy up and the excitement up, which is something you always want. Next slide. Another form of interaction is interaction with actors. This, of course, is going to be most relevant in real world experiences, but you can also have these happen online um, in all sorts of different forms. So actors definitely help with establishing the narrative and building out the world. They're really fun for players to interact with. As Ariel was saying, anytime you can get the energy of the group up, that helps. And having an actor there to do that is super useful. And another really fun way to use actors is to have them be something that needs to be unlocked. And what we mean by this is your actor will know that if at any point the players say something to them or do something specific to them or show something specific to them, then and only then the actor will release a bit of information that will keep them moving on their journey. So that's a really fun way to use actors. Next slide. So now let's talk about puzzles. Um, there are, to us, we sort of drive puzzles into two different types. There's aha puzzles. So these are puzzles that players solve with a stroke of insight. Um, and then there are process puzzles. This is following a series of steps until you reach the right answer. You should probably have a mix. Aha puzzles bring up excitement, but can be frustrating if people don't have that aha moment. That's like a riddle. Um, process puzzles, are really satisfying because you know what you're doing and you're working through it. But if you have too many of them, your room is going to feel like, or your room or your puzzle quest is going to feel like busy work. This would be 
like a word find or a Sudoku. Next slide, please. And we should mention that lexicon comes from Errol Elmer of Room Escape Divas, who has uh, spoken and written a lot on puzzle design and has a lot of other good resources if you want to check him out at Room Escape Divas. Um, okay, so matching slides or matching puzzles. That is a puzzle you are going to see this all the time in escape rooms, and it's where you need to figure out the two different elements connect and put them together. And this can be an aha puzzle or this can be a process puzzle. So an example of an aha puzzle is if there's a screw and you know you need to unscrew it, but you just don't have a screwdriver, but you've been given the spoon, nothing else but a spoon. There's nothing you need to eat. So you're thinking, what do I do? And you have your aha moment. I can use the spoon as a screwdriver. Um, Whereas an example of a process puzzle would be something where you see a collection of symbols and those symbols are all a certain color. And then elsewhere in the, in the room, you see that those colors are all in with a certain number. And then elsewhere, you see a lock that has the symbols, but the lock has numbers on it. So you need to connect the symbol to the color, to the numbers, and you've gone through the process of matching them all together. Next slide. You can have mechanical puzzles. So this is manipulating objects to achieve a desired result. Obvious um, example is a jigsaw puzzle. You have a lot of pieces, you're putting them together. This can also be spinning gears, um, which is just a, it's always a really fun big machine and people get a lot of joy out of making something work. Um, or pipe puzzles or just anything where you are building something and putting something together and making something work. That is a mechanical puzzle. And it's a very different skill set. So for example, um, I'm quite good at matching puzzles, but my husband is very good at mechanical puzzles. And if he sees one in a room or a puzzle class, he gets very excited and we all just let him do it. Next slide. And we're all very excited that he's there because I am horrific at gear puzzles. <laughs> I'm like, I definitely cannot handle these. I need my gear. <laughs> Uh, another type of puzzle is logic puzzles. This is where you're going to be processing a series of data points to reveal information and distill the information that you need. Now, this doesn't and frankly really should not be what you traditionally think of as a logic puzzles where players are filling out a grid of, you know, X is here and an O here and an X there. I personally really love those types of puzzles, but players in escape rooms, players in tabletop games who are just looking for, you know, solving puzzles, we have found that they do not <laughs> like those. Um, but you can find ways to make that same sort of thought process big and physical where you're, you know, moving around statues of gods who want to be placed in the correct place where they have everything that they want, whatever fits your narrative, but it's essentially just saying, okay, I'm going to need to take all of these data points and find a way to make them all true. Next slide. Um, perspective puzzles can be really fun. So this is a puzzle where if you look at something from the right angle, you can see the clue. This is um, actually a sign that's near my house for a college called CSUN. Um, and you can see at the top that it just kind of looks like weird squiggles. But then as you're driving by it and you get to the right place, you can see that it says CSUN. And it actually says it from both angles. It, it's very cool. Um, and players can have a lot of fun with this because, you know, they again, are manipulating an object where they are moving it about instead of just solving something with pen and paper. Um, and you can do this in all formats. You can have something that is big like a statue in an escape room. You can also have something on a card um, in a tabletop game or on a piece of paper. Next slide. Then we have deductive reasoning puzzles. This is essentially something like a Sudoku, but don't ever do just a normal Sudoku. It's essentially a joke in the escape room enthusiast group of how much people hate just seeing a plain old Sudoku in an escape room style experience. But there are lots of fun ways to use those same mechanics for a narrative puzzle. And you can say, okay, what would it be? Maybe 
in our fairyland puzzle, the fairy of rainbows wants to make sure that there is a flower placed in a specific plot in a specific way. If you can make it fit your world, but use that same deductive reasoning of putting everything in its correct place, that's going to be really fun for players. Next slide. Patterns. So this is a very sort of simple puzzle where you're trying to figure out what comes next. These are great for new players. Um, they're very intuitive, but you can do them in fun ways that really fit your narrative. Uh, so you could be, you know, wherever you could be in a city and you have to, and part of it is designing the, you know, where houses and stores go and there has to be a certain pattern to it. Whatever it is, these patterns are things that we see everywhere in everyday life so they can they are often very organic to narrative next slide there's also decoding slice uh, puzzles this would be something like a cipher and that's where players receive information that's been encoded and uh, they can either decode by frequency analysis, which is really a heavy puzzle, I would say, to expect escape room players to do, where essentially you look and you say, oh, well, this is probably an E because look at how frequently this happens. Um, or they find a key to the code and they'll use that key. And that doesn't just have to be, you know, A equals D. It can be a, this symbol equals this word. You can use it in a lot of different ways. You just want to make sure when you're using these puzzles that the translation isn't long and tedious because while it is initially delightful to finally get that key and be able to crack that code and know what it was saying after the first mm, word or two maybe three the the novelty and the joy has worn off and it just becomes work so you want to make those nice and brief in your games next slide and of course the way to make all of these puzzles more satisfying is if you layer them on top of each other. So what you can do is you can have the initial thing be a matching puzzle. You have to figure out that the, um, I actually was been watching Buffy recently and this, so I'm gonna use a Buffy example. Um, you have a book and it's filled with a language and it's very close to your language, but you realize that it's a code. And so you have to figure out where is the thing that goes with it. All right, so it has a name on the front and you figure out somewhere else in the room, there's that same name and within that is one object and that object inside is actually the key to decode the book. So this is layering, matching on top of decoding. Bonus points to anyone who's gonna name the episode in the chat. <clears throat> Go for it. Um, so that's so. If the more that you can layer puzzles, the more that they can fit together and be part of one cohesive narrative, the more satisfying your experience is going to be. Because as we stated at the beginning, the more things feel immersive and in story, the more players feel like the heroes. Next slide. So. Now, we personally think that these are very annoying puzzles and they do not generally go over well among the escape room and puzzling crowd. Uh, number one is math puzzles. I saw someone earlier in the chat already talking about how annoying math puzzles are. We totally agree. Very few people would pay good money to take a math test. And so you definitely don't want your puzzle game or experience to be full of difficult math. You can probably use very simple addition and very simple subtraction if it fits in as a part of another puzzle. But that's about as tricky as you want to go. We we went through a spate when we just were running into the golden ratio all the time in escape rooms. We're like, what is happening? Uh, and then the other thing is outside knowledge. Trivia nights are awesome. Pub trivia is great, but that has its own place. You never want to create an experience where you aren't equipping people with everything that they need to solve it. So you never want them to have to have some random outside knowledge. And if there are things that you need them to have to solve the puzzle, make sure that they have that information. So if they're gonna need to know Roman numerals, put a clock in the room that has Roman numerals because everyone knows what numbers should be on a clock and then they have an easy way to translate those Roman numerals. So make sure you give your players all the knowledge they need. 
Next slide. So here are a couple types of puzzles that are debatable. Um, riddles. So we put riddles in our games. I think riddles are really fun, but they are often the type of puzzle that you either get or you don't. So that can be very frustrating for people. Um, I would say that if you do use riddles, you should make them super simple. Something that you are fairly sure and you can be fairly sure if you play test your game enough that people will get. Um, another puzzle, a puzzle type that you see a lot but is kind of debatable on the fun scale is counting. This is really easy for new players, so that's a good thing. It's also really boring to sit there and have to count a bunch of stuff. So it's debatable. It can be used, we have used it. Um, you wanna make sure that you are using it within a context that hopefully makes it not obnoxious and boring. Next slide is questions. So, any questions, guys? Uh, I see there's discussion about smell puzzles, too, which we don't have in there, and that a lot of people do not like smell puzzles. And I think as long as it's a large group, there's probably going to be someone in the group who can solve it, which, again, speaks to giving everyone that hero moment, because some people have almost no sense of smell, and people like Ariel happen to have a great sense of smell. So it's great to have I where you smell can puzzles. Say, yeah, like, oh, okay, really if there's a the smell puzzle, puzzle, that's Ariel's hero moment. She's definitely going to shine in that moment. Um, all right, other questions. I'm just looking over here. Can we give an example of a counting puzzle? Julia? Sure. Yeah, uh, so yeah. if you have a lock in the room and the lock has a picture on it of a bird, a candlestick, and a frame, you are need, gonna need to count how many birds are in the room, how many candlesticks are in the room, and how many frames are in the room. And then you put those numbers into the lock and it opens the lock. So it's, it's very simple. It's just counting objects or counting colors or whatever that's a counting puzzle. Um, and Tempest is then asking, is it possible design, to design a counting puzzle where you can guarantee you have found all the things that need to be counted? It isn't, um, that is never possible, but you can do things that, you, you can do things to like hint people in the right direction. Um, again, this is play testing. So if people are, not finding all the candlesticks, then you can, you know, put them in more obvious places. Um, you can not, you, you can do things so like, it's not all the same number or there are other kind of clues as to what the number might be or that you might not have found everything. Um, all right, oh, what is your, per what puzzle types are your, personal kryptonite which types of puzzles can you just not do gear puzzles <laughs> cannot my brain does not work that way i cannot do gear puzzles Wait. i have an example of this and i'm i'm blanking on it right now but we just ran into this juliana where i was just like i'm never gonna be able. oh actually it's the oh, example sound. I use. sound yeah um sound puzzles i can't hear very like i hear just fine people talking but i cannot differentiate tones if you have to hear Morse code, forget it. Like, or the certain number of knocks or repeat, like a beat or something, it's it's pointless. It's, I, it will never be me who solves that puzzle. Um, uh, okay. And then I think it's Brian asking, how important is an overarching meta puzzle? Uh, is it a must have for a good experience? I think a meta puzzle, it's not a must have. Not, I'm not gonna say anything is a must have, but we love to use meta puzzles because it essentially says all of that hard work that you've done, everything that you have been laboring for, for all of this experience, it's all gonna come together and you're gonna need to use it in order to get the final answer. So it's a really beautiful way to tie together the entire experience. I would say the other thing that is very useful about meta puzzles and why we pretty much always use them is depending on your type of quest. So 
in the like in escape rooms or a tabletop game where you're sitting down and you're doing your quest, you have it all there. Meta puzzles are great for the narrative and for making you feel satisfied. Um, we have an online quest right now where theoretically people could just go to the last page of the website and solve the puzzle, um, but they can't because the last puzzle is a meta puzzle where you need all of the previous answers. So it, it's also a way to make sure that people play the whole game. Um, and it's sort of cheating themselves if they don't, um, but we also like to make sure that people do the whole game. And then Mischief Knight is asking, how do you balance meta puzzles while making it clear that already used clue stream items don't need to be used again? So I think there's a difference between clues and answers. And personally, because we're in the tabletop world, I know escape rooms generally tend to one and done. If you've used something, you're not gonna use it again. In the tabletop world, we do not think that is true. And we put that clearly in the instructions because people do tend to have that, uh, that mindset. But once you're paying to have an element made, if you can use it again, all the better. Um, but in ter if you do have a game where you said, okay, once you've used a clue, you're not gonna use it again, you can still hint them and say, but your answers are going to be important. So in the quest that we have right now, we say very clearly, write down your answers, you will need them later. Or in, um, we're doing something called Vampire Pizza. It's in a lot of places, uh, a lot of cities, it's sort of traveling about. Um, in that one, there is a final answer sheet um, that, so we're telling people to write down their answers. Uh, so then, you know, again, we're saying like, these, this is something that you're going to need to use. Uh, All right. And then we have a question, how many parts to a puzzle is too many? I've had escape rooms with like 12 parts to it where one wrong part meant that it was still wrong. This is a question of building and designing your experience. I don't think that there's an exact number. If you have a puzzle that is two parts, but to achieve those two parts, you're gonna need to figure out a lot of complicated things, then two might be the right number. Um, and if it's something like 12 parts, we actually tend towards having more puzzles because it leads to more faster solves in the time period, which is a more satisfying experience. People are getting that constant dopamine hit of I solved it, I solved it, I solved it. So we are all for having, you know, many, many puzzles in the experience. But if you have one wrong part, there should be clear signposts that tell you wrong along the way this is wrong. You need to go back and look at this. Um, and actually in uh, the mystery game that we're working on right now, we are making sure that we want to try to have something on the website that says, okay, you have this part wrong because we don't want people to go back and have to re-examine everything when they've got most of it right and just one wrong part. Um, is it possible to design a single puzzle that has a variable or selectable difficulty? Yes, I, that is definitely possible. Um, the ways that we've seen it done generally involve tech. So it's the type of thing um, I would say like there's, there's an aquarium escape room in New Orleans that does this quite well. Um, or the five wits escape rooms where if you solve a puzzle quickly, there's an iteration of that puzzle that is more difficult. Um, and it continues to be, and there's more and more puzzles that are more difficult. So this would be like a Simon Says or Bop It, where, you know, it just keeps getting harder. Um, in terms of, the other thing is in terms of escape rooms, you can have either bonus puzzles at the end if people solve too quickly. Um, you can have bonus quests, or you can know, like, you can have people select things so that some of the puzzles can be switched out with a more difficult form of that puzzle. Uh, and you can also alter the instructions that you're giving to people or give them no instructions. And so the easy one might really spell out what they should focus on and pay attention to very clearly, whereas the difficult version gives them no instruction whatsoever and it's up to them to zero in and figure out what's important in the puzzle. So that's another way to alter the difficulty. Um, okay, I think that that's all the questions I see. Let's, let's move on to playtesting. 
Oh, we got one more. <laughs> How do you clue or provide workarounds for mechanical, physical challenges, puzzles, if the group just can't do it? So you should always have an override, as we mentioned with the uh, physical. So if it's that, you know, when they throw those bags in the bucket, it's going to create a whole pulley system that's going to open up the door and allow them to access the next part of the room. There should be an electric way to override that where you can just hit a button and the uh, door goes up and they still get to access it. Um, in a tabletop game, <clears throat> And I guess this isn't specific, well, specifically for physical challenges, but in tabletop, what we do is if people just can't solve a puzzle, we generally provide a hint book, but then also an answer book. So if they just can't solve it, they're at home, they don't have a DM or GM or anything, they can just look up the answer. All right, let's get into playtesting again. Playtesting slide, please. <laughs> so playtesting, just going to go back to this. Harder is not better. Seriously, harder is not better. So if you're play testing and something is really hard and your puzzles will probably be too hard when you start. I don't think there is, I think there's maybe like one quest Juliana and I have designed where our puzzles didn't start out as too difficult. Almost always we have to scale back or innovate or do something because when we are designing puzzles, they seem easier in our heads than they actually are. Next slide. And again, with harder is not better, you need to remember that the goal is players having fun because you will probably find that a lot of your play testers have suggestions on how to make your game harder. And people like to do this because it makes them feel really smart where they're like, okay, I know I spent 45 minutes solving that, but you know how you could make it harder? Let me tell you. And you have to understand that while it seems to just kind of be human nature to have ideas on how to make things harder, you can listen to the comments and then thank them. But remember, your goal is always fun. And I do just want to address real quick, we got a question of how do you create effective puzzles that are more inclusive, like for colorblind, hard of hearing, et cetera. Um, there is a really great website that is slipping my mind right now, but that you can actually uh, see how different things look to different sorts of colorblind people. Um, so I'm sure if you Google it, you can find it and that'll let you know. Um, there's also a Facebook group where you can have people who are colorblind or I'm not sure about hard of hearing, but definitely colorblind test your puzzle and let you know where there's issues. Um, and then also there's things you can do where color is not the only clue. So while you might have things that are all different colors, you also want to have a font or a symbol or something else that ties it together beyond color. So while it may be easier if you can perceive the color, it's still solvable because of a difference in symbol or font or something else. Um, hard of hearing, so many of our things are visual. so. We haven't really run into that being a problem so far, but there's a lot of great groups on like gaming accessibility where you can sort of run your designs by them. Yeah, and I would say that unfortunately puzzles can never, like not all puzzles are going to be good for all people. Um, you should aim for the majority of people who are going to be coming through your doors. Um, and you know you should do what you can we went into a room once where you had to have someone who was over 510 to complete the room um like if a group of all women come in you're not gonna have someone over 510 probably so that seems really unfair to us um if there are if you do have a sound puzzle um i you know you should either be able to bypass that puzzle if the group is hard of hearing or, you know, maybe just have another puzzle in the back that you can sub in for whatever that puzzle is. And, you know, it would be particularly cool if it is a puzzle that is particularly good for people who are hard of hearing. So maybe something that utilizes, um, like, I'm, I want to use the word beat, but it's like vibrations um, or something that, you know, uses ASL. So, you know, I think if if you can, 
you sh can anticipate and make something special um, for all players. All right, next okay. slide. Actions speak louder than words. We want to look at what are your play testers doing. This is going to give you so much more information. So you want to be in there with a notebook writing down what is it that they're actually doing. Because oftentimes in the rush of winning a game, people get so excited and they're like, that's great, I loved it, so fun. But you need to know like, okay, no, they were really frustrated at this puzzle. They were doing, you know, X, Y, and Z, and it was sending them in a very bad direction where they were super frustrated. So that's something that I need to change. So always pay attention to what are they doing. Next slide. When you do make changes, you want to change thoughtfully and not reactively. Uh, I would say that quite a lot of Juliana and I's early arguments would you know, be, I would play test with one group, she would play test with another group, and we would call each other and I'd be like, oh my gosh, this puzzle needs to change. My group hated it. And she's like, no, my group loved that puzzle, but this other puzzle is just totally broken. So when you are making changes um, in a puzzle game, you really want to think about not just if a group got frustrated, oh my gosh, that puzzle needs to go, but think about why they got frustrated there. And then was it just that group or have other groups also been getting um, frustrated at the same place? So we often wait till we get at least three, you know, three play tests in to start looking at, unless something's like horribly broken, um, to start looking at what are we going to change and how do we change that puzzle so that it isn't frustrating and it is fun because the three different groups may have all had trouble with the same puzzle, but it might have been slightly different. So we have to think about like the tweaks being something that make the puzzle more innovative and fun for everybody. Next slide. You also want to look at what do people want to do? This is where some of your very best ideas might come from because they might think that they're supposed to do X, Y, and Z and you wanted them to do A, B, C. But if you're seeing that group after group is kind of inherently thinking that they should do X, Y, Z, maybe consider, is that a better puzzle? Is there a way to take that inclination that people have and then have that direct them to do ABC? Or do you want to spin that off into entirely its own sort of puzzle? So people will give you a lot of really good and interesting ideas with what they think think they should do. And you want to cater to that and reward that. If everyone is searching in a specific place, put some information in that place because you know people are going to find it and be excited that there was something there. Next slide. So after a play test, you're going to get notes from people. And it's really important when you get those notes to not be defensive. The notes might be terrible. Um, they might be, it might be, for example, an FBI decoder who thinks that this puzzle that everyone else struggled with is the easiest thing in the world and he's telling you how to make it harder. Um, it, whatever it is, you still need to hear sort of the note behind the note and try to be polite um, and hear that the person is trying to help. And also, if they are giving a note on a puzzle, there might be something, you know, depending on how many people have had trouble with that puzzle, there is probably something that you need to change. It might not be the thing that they're saying, but there might be a kernel in what they're saying that is helpful to you. So it is good if you can keep your composure. I'm not so good at this. Julianne is much better at it. <laughs> well, because you also <laughs> want to hear everything that they have to say. And if they see that you're shutting down and being defensive, maybe their next note was going to be brilliant but they will just stop and we have this as well because we play test for a lot of our friends who are escape room designers as well and even just when we play out in the world and people are like oh you've played so many like what did you guys think we'll give our thoughts honestly and try to be constructive and helpful but if we can see that everything we're saying the designer is just like yeah but this and this and this then we're going to stop giving notes because it's like okay that's fine like you don't have to listen to us but then I'm not going to waste my time and so if you can try to not be defensive you might end up getting some gems that otherwise they would not have told you next slide Juliana's favorite slide 
No, oh, so sad. <laughs> it bothers me every time I see it. Um, go for it. So you do need to be willing to kill your babies. And this will be very, very sad um, because you will love them. Of course, there will be puzzles that you are so thrilled to have come up with and you think that they are beautiful and innovative and fun and your play testers hate them. And you can try to make tweaks and changes and guide them through and more signposts and more clues, but it's just still not working. And so you really have to be willing to listen to your play testers and understand that at the end of the day, they are the ultimate authority because they are your players. That is who you are making this for. And you need to be willing to let go of things. And Ariel and I actually now avoid a lot of arguments by saying, because one of us will have a baby and the other one saying, this is not something we should have. And we just say, play test. We'll play test, we'll play test, we'll play test. And then there's no more argument because it is crystal clear if players like it or don't like it and you go from there. Next slide. So playtesting on email, um, this is something that you may have to do or that can be very useful. So it is always better to playtest in person if you can, particularly to begin with. Being able to watch the way that people are interacting, um, being able to see when they get frustrated, hearing their thoughts as they're playing is incredibly useful information that you should try to get. But Playtesting over email can depending on your final medium. Um, when you are watching people play test, they will act differently than if they were on their own playing. So when they play a puzzle by themselves, they're going, they're going to have a different experience and you want to know how long does it take people to solve your puzzle in that context? How much fun do they have in that context? Often they might be a little bit more honest also. Um, it also helps you get more play testers. It can be really hard to schedule play tests. Um, even, even in the middle of a pandemic, it seems like everyone's busy. Um, so the more, if you are sending puzzles out, and if you have puzzles you can send out, you can get a lot more play tests. And the more play tests, the better, always. When you are thinking about putting together groups of play testers, you really want each group to contain um, a mix of different types of testers. So when we play test our games, we you know go to like the Escape Room Enthusiasts. Now that's a group of people who are really good at puzzles. Puzzles are their thing. Um, that is one group of very valuable testers. We also both have kids in um, preschool. We also go to the preschool parents who maybe aren't puzzle designers or you know maybe aren't that into puzzles it's not their thing at all but they're like oh that sounds fun sure i'll try it out that's a different group of testers and then depending on your audience um, you may also need to go for kids uh, which is an entirely different group of testers so it's really important to get people from a lot of different worlds who are at a lot of different levels um, and then on the right you can see um, if you are play testing over email you want to send a survey so that you get specific answers um, that will help you figure out how to iterate on your puzzle. And this is a sample survey um, that we send out. Next slide. And we've been oh, doing, sorry, I would just say, we've been doing a lot of video chat testing since the pandemic began. And while it is not nearly as useful <laughs> as being in person with people, it is still far more informative than you know, just getting a survey back from people. So as much as possible, you do want to be able to watch people as they play and hear what they're thinking, if at all possible. Okay, working with artists. Um, artists know how to make things beautiful, which is wonderful, but beautiful can sometimes be more confusing. And so you're really gonna need to strike that balance where, you know, for uh, an example, when we did our game, and uh, Mattel gave it to their artist and he gave it back and it had this gorgeous old spindly script just as a background. You couldn't quite read the words, but it was clearly writing and it looked wonderful, but it was like, oh no, people will spend their entire time thinking that they need to decipher what this script is. It's words, of course it's important. So you need to get rid of this. 
Um, but when you're working with artists, you really only want to give them the important notes, the things that are really going to mess with gameplay because um, you want to try to not be nitp nitpicky. And you also want to know when to play test instead of noting. So if you see something and you think right off, this is going to be a huge problem, I know it is, you, you might give the note or you might just say, well, let's play test and let's see. And then if your play testers are having that problem, it puts you in an even uh, greater place of authority to go back to the artist and say, here's what everyone thought we need to fix this. Um, and then finally, when you get your final art from your artist, make sure that you always play test that because it often will change things slightly. So you might need to make a few more tweaks once you have your final art. Next slide. Uh I'm just, yep. and I'm just going to add one thing here. So when, just the difference between when you note and when you play test, if you've already given a bunch of notes, it is probably time to start play testing before you give notes. So, you know, you don't, you just don't want to overwhelm with notes. You want to have a good relationship and that's, and that is part of it. So like if you've already given a couple, then, and you have another one, play test and then see if you really need to give that note. All right, next slide. Okay, so uh, you were asking before, what sort of research can we do uh, in order to get better at puzzle design? And we call this get your degree in puzzle design. So you can play lots and lots of escape rooms, especially right now, there's actually an opportunity to do a lot of uh, virtual rooms where you can see some of the best rooms in the world. Uh, like I know catacombs that we played in Amsterdam that's actually in the catacombs of an old church. You can play it virtually. There's a prison escape where you're actually escaping from a giant prison and you can play it virtually and there's actors in the prison that you get to interact with. Um, so now is a great time to really see what's out there all over the world. There's also a ton of at-home escape games. Um, of course, in our biased opinion, we think Escape Room in a Box series is great. So that's the World of Experiment and Flashback. But really, you should play them all. The Exit games, the Unlock games, Think Fun has some games out. And then there's a lot of escape games that are more uh, bespoke and custom. And there are some really wonderful things out there. Um, there's Hank's Elevator from Bluefish Games is fantastic. Rita Orlov designed The Tale of Ord. That's completely sold out, but she has a Kickstarter going right now for her next game, which is The Emerald Flame, which looks gorgeous. And we got to play test some puzzles from there. So definitely check that out. Um, there's a lot of wonderful at-home puzzle games that you can play. There's also puzzle books. I saw someone already mentioned uh, Puzzle Craft is a really useful book on both how to construct puzzles and then it also has puzzles in it that you get to do, so that's wonderful. Um, Journal 29 is a really fun book. So those are, uh, there's also a quick little, uh, it's called Puzzle Snacks that just has quick little puzzles in it. So there's a lot of great puzzle books out there in the world as well. Um, and then reading puzzle novels, middle grade sort of books, uh, sometimes have a lot of these. So check out all of those. And um, did you say Escape This Podcast? Uh, there's a oh, no, yeah. um, There's a fantastic podcast called Escape This Podcast, uh, which is done by a dungeon master out of Australia who um, at, like sort of DMs people through escape rooms and it is so much fun and like so fun to listen to there's a ton of episodes i think they're on season five or six at this point um highly recommend listening to it so um the next we often get a quite next slide um we often did, we often get a question about copywriting like if you should copyright your game and we were told by a lot of people we should copyright um, werewolf experiment and we didn't um, because at the end of the day you really can't copyright puzzle games if somebody changes one small element the copyright is void but it also just I, I would say that it just doesn't matter that much because there aren't really new puzzles you know as we've gone through there's different types of puzzles there are cool ways to innovate on them but there aren't really new puzzles there's just better ways of doing them and if you make really awesome, beautiful, innovative puzzles, then people will buy your game and it doesn't really matter if someone steals your base mechanic. Um, 
I think I'm going to call out Post Curious one more time here because like Vita Orlov's puzzles are just so incredibly gorgeous. Yeah, sure, you could steal like, you know, whatever the pattern she does, but I'm still going to play her game over it, you know, probably because the way that she has done her puzzles is really so fantastic. All right, and then we're, we're on to questions. All right, and I think there were some questions earlier in the chat, so I'm going to just slide right back up. I think we might need to change it to Kill Your Darlings. That would make me happier because that slide does always make me sad. <laughs> I don't um, know. We'll have to see the picture I find for that. <laughs> Um, okay, so here's a question. What are the best ways to distribute games besides buying a place and physically making rooms? Print and play is an option. Um, yeah, I think print and play is definitely an option. I think you can also build um, things online to do that. And then there's a huge market of people who will buy escape room games. There's a lot of people making them themselves, uh, like Bluefish or Post Curious. Um, escape the Crate is a subscription box where it's a guy putting, you know, cutting everything up and putting it all together. So you can also craft this yourself and just put it out in the world. There's um, an escape room enthusiast group that's probably gonna have a lot of people who'd be interested in buying it, a puzzle people group. You can definitely go out and find your audience. And I would suggest becoming a part of these groups now and seeing you know, what are these people like, playing all the other games, what are the games they're enjoying so that when you do go to market your game to them, you can speak from a place of authority. And then I see, what's your preference in an escape room? Action-based games or logic-based puzzles? Both. I want both. Um, like, I, there's nothing better than after, like, doing a logic puzzle to, you know, get up and stretch and, like, get to do something active. And then after that, to start using my brain again. Um, every, there, sh there should always be a mix of everything to keep people on their toes and to keep people energized. And then we have a question, how often do you find a cool item or technology and then design a puzzle to use it versus designing a cool puzzle and then finding the materials tech to implement it? Um, I would say that occasionally we will find something and we just keep it in the back of our minds. Like we recently discovered there's an ink called Snapshot Ink where when you take a picture with a flash, it reveals an image. And so that's just percolating in the back of our minds. We haven't been able to implement it in a game yet, but knowing that that cool tech exists, it's definitely there when we think about what we can make. Um, but far more often it's us saying, here's the puzzle that fits the narrative, here's what fits the world, now is this something that I can implement in the game? And I would also say it depends on the context. Um, so, you know, we have, um, so we have a puzzle quest up right now. It's, um, it's for Nancy, it's for the CW's Nancy Drew. So, um, it's not on the slide, but it's www.nancydrewatxquest.com. And it's free, you can play through the whole thing. And one of the things we have in it is that you solve a puzzle and then you are gonna see a video with an actor doing some sort of cool magical reveal. So we had to think, okay, what are cool magical reveals that we can do in this context where, um, where the actors aren't actually solving the puzzles, which are gonna be very different magical reveals from ones that you're going to get when you can't have people find them beforehand. So just to spoil one of them, there is a candle where you end up seeing letters. Well, the actor's quite able to see the letters, um, but they're just a lot more obvious when he lights it up. So it's still a really cool reveal on camera. It would be a very bad reveal in a room because you can see the letters the whole time if you're physically there. Whereas in a room, um, <clears throat> if you have some like, a secret door open, that is going to be a really cool reveal that people didn't see coming. And then we have the question of what was the hardest darling or baby of yours to kill? And for me, it is going to be going all the way back to our first game. To Still the logic on that logic puzzle. puzzle. Because, and I'll say <laughs> this is why, because at the time it felt so heart-wrenching for me. And I think as I've become a more and more experienced designer and just realized that through playtesting, 
even if I love a puzzle, if I see that it is failing with an audience and it is not bringing them joy and it is just bringing them frustration, even if I might have loved it initially, I will then say, no, just forget it. We've got to kill this puzzle. It's just not working. It's true that I don't think we've ever tried to keep a puzzle in so hard as that first logic puzzle <laughs> that just did not work. It just didn't. Um, we have found how to use logic puzzles since then, which has made us happy. Yeah. Um, so it says, what do you do about fabrication? That really depends on the project. Um, for Escape Room in a Box, um, the werewolf experiment, we initially uh, created, and I assume this fabrication is manufacturing, we initially created it ourselves. We used a company um, called Product Greenhouse who helped coordinate um, between us and a factory in China. And that was how we created the first 3000. And then we were over the moon when Mattel said that they wanted to license the game and we never had to deal with manufacturing that again because it was incredibly hard and took a year of our lives when we did not get to design. Um, so in terms of games, like in terms of tabletop games, generally for fabrication at this point, we are trying to find a publisher to make it for us. Um, in terms of the smaller projects we do, like this Nancy Drew quest that we just did, uh, I can show you, we fabricated it ourselves. So look here, this is one of the materials right here. It's a piece of paper that we had to burn something onto. Um, so for smaller things where we're not making a lot of, uh, we also did an escape room box for Sony last year for their escape room movie. We made that ourselves. It was a lot of trips to the dollar store and a lot of, um, hiring our friends to do like uh, factory line um, melting wax on candles to stick keys inside, that kind of thing. Okay, and then Armchair Escapist asks, when you've done puzzles to tie in with a specific IP, such as Invisible Man, Prodigal Son, how was it to craft puzzles within the constraints of the IP? We love doing this sort of thing. Um, I'll confess, since we started designing and making games, I hardly ever get a chance to watch TV or movies anymore unless we get hired to work on them. And then I get to say, sorry, I need to watch entire the entirety of season one of Nancy Drew. It's my job. Um, so I, I love that. And I also love getting to step into a world that has already been created with rich characters and there's so much fun things to play with. So I love to watch a movie or a TV show and say, Ooh, this could be used. I can incorporate this element and take that. Um, someone once gave the analogy of essentially, if you tell someone draw on this blank canvas, it's, it's can be very tricky and very daunting, but if you give them a circle and you say draw in the circle, they can make it a sun, they can make it a smiley face, they can make it a flower. Like having some form of constraint can sometimes actually free your creativity. So for us having the constraint of an existing IP and knowing that there's fans that we need to serve is a really wonderful challenge that we love to work with. Uh, so I see it actually it's right, it's on topic. Um, does the theme always follow the creation of puzzles or do you ever start with, oh dear, someone else asked something, ever start with a theme and base puzzles out of it? Actually, we always start with the theme and narrative and the puzzles always come out of the theme and narrative. Um, we never start with the puzzles and then put a theme on top of it. So, I mean, it's, it's really everything we do. We say, okay, this is our world what puzzles would fit within that world because we have like puzzle compendiums whenever we run into a puzzle or a weird ad on facebook or a pro an art project at our kids school that might be a cool puzzle we write down every well juliana writes down everything um i text juliana and tell her to write it down um <laughs> and so we have a puzzle compendium of all of these really cool puzzles but then it's always about what is the world, what is the narrative, what will fit the most organically into that world and narrative so that this is the best immersive experience it can be. And then we have the question of how is it different designing puzzles together but social distancing? Y'all, this is so hard. I haven't seen Ariel physically. I've seen her pretty much every day in this form, but I haven't seen her physically in months upon months and it's 
awful. I miss her so much. And I know I get to see her virtually, but it is not the same. And so, I mean, we we do what we can. Um, but even, even with that, we found there's times where it's just like, okay, if we're working on something, let's just get on Google Hangout. Let's actually see each other face to face because it is different and we are better at creating when we can see each other than when we are creating in our own vacuums and then presenting to each other. So it's been hard, but we're doing it. <laughs> and I would say that um, just in general, sort of uh, off of that, uh, first of all, yes, I agree. I miss you so much. <laughs> um, but off of that, we do have sort of a flow to the way that we design games um, and puzzles. So we generally start, so we, again, we start with the narrative, but then we get on the phone or Google chat. And the first thing we do is we just brainstorm and we just talk to each other. We just say, well, what about this? Or what about this? Or what about this? Or me? Okay. So these three things would work for that, but what about these? And like, what's the map? Um, and how does that map fit the story? And what, you know, what resources can we use? What things can we do? And we have this big conversation. And then from there we say, okay, now we have the broad overview. What are the materials? that we need to create for that overview. So we need to create a logic puzzle. We need to create a letter that's going to have some information in it. Um, we need to create a newspaper article, whatever it is. And then we divide up the elements that we need to create and kind of go off into our separate caves and create them. Something that we've been finding useful recently is because thankfully we have enough games to create. Um, we've been having the big conversations together, dividing the games and then making, and then going through the very basic version of each other's games, just to make sure that it's not completely broken. Um, and this is actually specifically for the mystery games we're working on um, for Renegade right now. So it's, that's, yeah, we that's haven't a process. Mentioned that. Yeah, <laughs> we have mystery on. games coming out from Renegade next year. So check those They're out. They're going to be super cool. It's really cool that we had something to work on right now that involved um, sitting at a computer a lot because that works. All right. Uh, so, okay. So we have do you have any best practices avoid at all costs when it comes to providing clues to the players? Um, I'm not sure if you mean clues or hints. In terms of hints, that's where if they're asking for help, they're saying, I need a hint. For that, you want to go as graduated as you possibly can, given the medium. So as much as possible, you want to say, OK, I want to just give you a little bit of a hint so that you can still feel like you solved it yourself. Um, and then if you mean in terms of clues, like in terms of the actual things that they will need to solve the puzzle, I don't, in terms of best practices, it's just whatever is going to lead them there without shoving them there. Do you have any further thoughts on that, Ariel? It really depends on the puzzle. I mean, I would say yeah. that in terms of clues, go back to the narrative. Like, what what is a clue that would fit in that, that would organically come out of that narrative? And this was a conversation you and I were having yesterday, Juliana. We were trying to figure out, you know, for a certain type of puzzle, what would the clue be? And it's um, it's a historical project. So we're like, okay, well, what are materials that would have been at that point in history? Um, and yeah, in terms of hints, I think it's a really hard line to walk, but you want to try to get the person to solve it themselves, even if you're kind of hand holding them to get there. All right. So what is one of your personal escape room favorites that you've done? Oh, dear. Oh. Um, okay. All right. Amsterdam. The vault was so cool because it was so immersive because you start in a parking lot and have to break into a car and then like go into the actual like old building. It's very cool. Um, in LA, uh, Hatch um, Lab Rat is so great. They're building something right now called the ladder that's gonna be replayable and point-based. I just, I can't even imagine. I am looking forward to it. Um, Stash House is incredible. That's by Tommy Haunton. Um, Oh my gosh. Palace so Games in San Francisco is fun. Oh, Palace. Oh my gosh. The level of tech that they have there is mind blowing. And the rooms are massive. They keep 10 to 12 players, like active, really good puzzle players, busy the entire time. And it's so sprawling and epic and wonderful. Um, and in New Orleans, Escape My Room, it's um, it's just, it's really cool. It has one of the most immersive lobbies I've ever been in. Their, their level of immersion for an escape room is amazing. Nearby in Baton Rouge are the 13th Gate escape rooms, coolest sets 
probably anywhere. Um, oh, there's so many. E yeah. Email us. Yeah. Email us where there's, you are. We'll give you suggestions. There's, there's so many good escape rooms. The uh, Terpka, the Top Escape Rooms Project. If you Google that, that is a bunch of enthusiasts got together and all voted of the escape rooms they had done. They ranked them all. There was an incredibly nerdy and wonderful algorithm to then put them into this final list. And so that is an excellent resource if you are looking for the best of the best anywhere in the world. Um, and that, mm -hmm. and any more questions? Magic eye puzzles. We've never put in a magic eye puzzle. We, we don't have the artistic skill to do that, but also, also I cannot see them. Yeah. There's a lot of people who can't see them and that's, I think a really high frustration point. So we would probably not use one in a game. Terpka, the top escape rooms project. Uh, I'm not sure what the CA is. But if you just Google Top Escape Rooms Project, or it, it was Terpka, so check that out. <laughs> Probably because it comes out of Canada, right? Does oh, it? maybe. California? I don't know. Uh, go to the next slide, please. Just so this has all of our contact information. Um, so, oh, thank you, Tempest. Yes, thank you. <laughs> you can make them up. Okay. Um, any other questions on puzzles or escape rooms or putting puzzles into tabletop games, anything like that. And I'll say one more thing to just throw out there. So what we have right now out in the world, um, we have both of the escape room in a box games from Mattel. We have uh, the Nancy Drew quest that's running right now that was in the chat. And then also if you go to vampire.pizza, that is popping up in cities all over the US. Uh, it is an immersive gaming experience it's delivered to you by a vampire where you get to join the vampire revolution. And uh, it comes with pizza. Yeah, <laughs> and dessert. <laughs> um, so that will be in New York next. Um, I think it's actually next weekend. So if you go to vampire.pizza, I believe, I might be wrong, but I believe you can make reservations for New York for next weekend or sign up to have it come to your city. <laughs> You're going to have to make your own Bloody Mary for Vampire Pizza, but we believe in you. <laughs> um, great. Yeah, well, thank you, everyone. We really appreciate you coming and listening to us. Yeah, hope this was helpful. <laughs> and again, feel free to reach out if you have any other questions. <laughs>